Peter, he is risen. Let's try that again. He is risen. Stand together with us as we join the Lord in worship as we sing, Come Christians, join to sing. Come Christians, join to sing. Good morning. Good morning. What a great message to proclaim. When you read the book of Acts and when you, you see preached over and over again, he is risen. He is risen. What a difference it made in the, the apostles themselves. You know, before the cross, after the cross, after the resurrection, it transformed them. And it reminds us, you know, that the, risen make, the resurrection makes a great difference in our life. The gospel makes a great difference difference in our lives and it is the message really that kind of divides the world either you believe or you don't 
And uh, this morning we, are, we heard news in Sri Lanka. There's uh, here on, on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, makes many, and now listen, places all over this world, it, Christians and churches become the focus of persecution and uh, senseless, senseless killing. And so, you know, we, we are united with brothers and sisters around the world. And you know, when you're saved, you get a heavenly father, you get a family, family of God. And aren't you glad to be saved today? And, and so we pray. Yeah, we, we rejoice, but we weep also for those who don't believe. And it's just amazing how the message of the resurrection, you know, causes a lot of animosity in this world even today. It's so good to see you. We'll ask our congregation to be seated. Our ushers can remain standing. We're about to uh, receive an offering, so we want you to be able to, to uh, give here in a minute. We're going to uh, ask God's blessings on this offering. Now, first... The re I want to thank the Lord for the great sunrise. Uh, it, was, it was a 10, wasn't it? Was, Y'all were there? I mean, the Lord, a clear day, He laced just a few clouds to soak up that beautiful color. Did y'all so see that? Beautiful day. And so we had a great morning service. And wasn't the breakfast great? Thank you, Brother Bill. Thank you, workers. And, and it was just wonderful. And we're glad you were there to enjoy that with us. Good time of fellowship. And so we are already blessed people and we're thankful, aren't we? And so uh, we're going to ask our, our ushers to receive our offering as we uh, bless this. And if you, members of our church, uh, you have this opportunity to worship the Lord through your gifts. Then we're going to move this service along. We have a wonderful music presentation. The choir, Brother Petty John's done a wonderful job. Our instruments and narrative and testimonies and a message and so we're here to worship our risen lord and king amen? amen let's bow our heads father we're grateful we're grateful for all you are we are heirs of christ joint heirs with god we have received all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and we know that the difference is the gospel and the resurrection so father we're a blessed people and we pray, dear Father, your blessings upon us with open hearts and hands. We say thank you, dear Lord, for all that you are, all that you have given us this day. Bless this service and this offering. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
comes stepping down from glory. Bethlehem is just the start of the story. Here he comes. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes teaching in the temple, making timeless wisdom sound simple. Here he comes. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes to seek and save, to wash our every sin away. Hear the captive start to say, here he comes. Here he comes, giving sight to the blind man, calling out, giving life to a dead man. Here he comes. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes, Hosanna's loudly ringing. Carries the cross along the way of suffering. Here he comes. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes to seek and to save, to wash our every sin away. Hear the captives start to say, Here he comes. Glorious day, he is risen from the grave. All creation shouts his praise. Here he comes. My heart beats with expectation, my soul lakes with anticipation. A water bow about a celebration when we see him in the sky. Here he comes. truth that we celebrate together today, the truth that my story and yours began long before the day we were born. Our story really begins with his story, one of grace and redemption, long before we ever took our first breath. God knew that we would be sinners, standing in the need of a Savior. Roman 5 tells us that while we were without strength, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In his perfect wisdom, he knew that the only one that could satisfy the price of our sin demanded his son, his only son, Jesus Christ. We find joy, not sadness, in his death because our debt was paid. And that is where my story begins, when a sinless Savior stood in my place.
was the single most horrible day in the history of the world. No incident has ever been more tragic. No future event will ever match it. No surprise attack, no political assassination, no financial collapse, no military invasion, no atomic detonation or nuclear warfare, no cataclysmic act of terrorism, no large-scale famine or disease, not even slave trading, ethnic cleansing, or decade-long religious warring can eclipse the darkness of that day. No suffering has ever been so unfitting. No human has ever been so unjustly treated because no other human has ever been so worthy of praise. No one else has ever lived without sin. No other human has ever been God himself. No horror surpasses what transpired on a hill outside of Jerusalem almost two millennia ago. And yet, we call it Good Friday. Judas meant it for evil. The Jewish leaders meant it for evil. Pilate meant it for evil. The people meant it for evil. But God, oh God, he meant it for good. God was at work doing his greatest good on the most horrible evil over and in and beneath the spiraling evil of Judas, the Jewish leaders, Pilate, the people, and all forgiven sinners, God's hand is steady, never to blame for evil, ever working it for our final good. God wrote good on the single worst day in the history of the world. And there is not one day or week or month or year or lifetime of suffering not one trauma, not one loss, not one pain, momentary or chronic, over which God cannot write good for you in Christ Jesus. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin but your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, and my feet rose to dance. When death was
do we find comfort in something that is so cruel as a cross? A place that was meant for death and suffering for Jesus is a place of healing and comfort for all who believe. Some don't see the mercy of the cross, but there will come a time when we will all see the cross for what it is, a display of God's mercy. For those who believe, that day will be filled with rejoicing. For others, it will be too late. Though my sin has helped drive those nails, Christ loves and has forgiven me. When I take my final breath on this earth, I know I will draw my breath in heaven. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord.
I can't imagine why Christ would be willing to leave the splendor of heaven, trade in his royal robes for this earthly flesh, walk among sinful men, and willingly die in my place. It seems almost too good to be true, but that's exactly what Christ did for us. He demonstrated his great love for us. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That is the mind-bending truth of the gospel. That while we were worthless in this world, he saw for us what could be. And he paid the highest price to redeem us. to say the words, I love you. In fact, it has been said so many times without any depth that for many, that phrase has lost its meaning. It is so much more powerful when love is demonstrated, proven to us through actions and not just words. When I think about Christ's nail-pierced hands, the wounds on his back, and the thorns in his head, all done for me. I see the greatest demonstration of love that has ever been made. John 15, 13 reminds us of this truth. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man may lay down his life for his friends. The small and great 
perfect, he died for all. On Calvary, the scars say, I love you. to think what it would have been like to see Christ in person, to have been there when he fed 5,000, or when he raised Lazarus from the grave. What an incredible opportunity to see the Savior face to face. The exciting truth is that for those who place your faith in Jesus Christ, we will see him face to face, Amen. just as he is. As thousands were fed, the blind eyes heal broken spirits. He moved with compassion. 
stop the dead.
Have you stopped and thought about the idea of Jesus Christ being an actual king here on earth? We read about it in the Bible. We even sing about it. But maybe it doesn't seem that it will actually happen. Have you ever given it some serious thought? Do we really believe that Christ will come and rule on earth? Do we wake up each morning looking for it to actually happen? Those of us that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior would say yes. But then we bog ourselves down with what is currently happening and forget what is actually going to happen. Christ is going to come, and he is going to make all things right. We need to be ready for his return. But what if you are here, but what if you are here and you haven't asked for Christ's forgiveness? Does this still apply to you? The answer is yes. We all need to be ready for when he comes. Will you be ready when he returns as king forever? The throne was left empty. The crown was left behind The angels watched in wonder As the king stepped into time To dwell among us To wear a robe of flesh Living just to die and bear the world's unrighteousness, but death couldn't conquer the Lamb, and now He is seated at the Father's right hand.
1 John. 1 John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles. 1 John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 3. Lavished love, lasting hope. In John 3 and 1, we find a statement of wonder and amazement. As John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. A statement, statement was made by the Apostle John. He was often called the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It seems that John uh, must have been more spiritually aware and sensitive than the other apostles. Some say that Jesus actually favored Jesus above the other disciples. Well, I know that in Jerusalem, as they celebrated the Last Supper, you know, together, it was John who reclined on Jesus' breast. He, was, he always sat closer. And while Christ, our Savior, while He was hanging on the cross, He committed the care of His mother, Mary, to John. It's been said that God doesn't have his favorites, but he has his intimates. Well, for sure Jesus loved his disciples equally, but perhaps, perhaps it just seemed like he favored John because, you know, it was John who was always near. He was always sought the love of his Lord and his Savior. I mean, what a, what a tremendous statement here in 1 John 3, 1. Behold, look, look. Look with your eyes, but more look with your heart. Behold what manner of love. I mean, contemplate the quality and the, the, the extent of God's love. That word love in the Greek there is agape. And it speaks of a quality of love that is uniquely God. And this is a dimension of love that, well, we might say is just out of this world. You know what I mean? Behold, what manner of love, notice, the Father. The Father hath bestowed. This, this love flows from our heavenly Father, who himself is defined by love. Paternity, fatherhood, speaks of an intimate, loving, continuing relationship between a father and a child that just grows closer every day. This, this kind of love is secure, you know? I heard someone say the other day that more than being loved, children really need to be Secure, feel secure. Well, true love makes you feel secure, right? Oh, and it's selfless. And it's, it's not fickle. It's unwavering. The Apostle John knew this quality of God's love because he had witnessed it firsthand. The love of God is like none other. And as John considers the love of men and the love of God, he realized that, you know, that God's love shines like a bright beacon in the sea of man's fake inferior love. And John tells us, actually, later in 1 John chapter 4, Verse 8, that God is love. God is the, you might call the fountainhead, right? Of the river of love. And the further away from the wellspring of love that you get, the more diluted and polluted it becomes until really it's, it's no longer genuine love. I'm reminded of a, cartoon strip, Peanuts, you know. Lucy had it for Schroeder. 
And she, Schroeder was playing, and Lucy says to Schroeder, well, guess what? I mean, what if, what if uh, you, uh, if you just don't tell me you love me, I think I'm just going to hold my breath until I pass out. And Schroeder, Schroeder looks at her, and he says, breath holding in children is an interesting phenomenon. It could indicate a meta metabolic disorder. A 40 milligram dose of vitamin B7 twice a day might be helpful. Yeah, I think that's probably it. You need vitamin B6. You also need to eat more bananas, avocados, and beef liver. And Lucy says in disgust, I ask for love, all I get is beef liver. That's pretty much this world. John says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed. Look at that. Hath bestowed. That, that phrase means to be lavished. Generally. Extravagantly. I mean, to lavish means to, shall we say, pour it on. You know? And John is saying that God the Father is not stingy with His love. Oh, love is giving, isn't it? And there you are, you're watching the news. And they, you know, I've noticed lately, yes, I noticed these things, Brahms commercials. And they're in high definition. We see their latest Ice cream sundaes, mounds and mounds of vanilla and chocolate and strawberry ice cream, heaped with hot fudge and caramel and strawberries. And did I say anything about the whipped cream? <laughs> this is love. I've got grandchildren that just take that and go. And a cherry on top, right? I'm just telling you. That's what it means to lavish. You know? Pour it on. And John tells us that God the Father has done just that. He has poured out His great love. And notice, it's upon us. Most amazing thing of all. Just think. We, we are the recipients of His love. Today, everyone can say, I am loved. Man, we just need God, don't we? We need the God of the Bible. You know, it really doesn't matter if you acknowledge God or not. Regardless, even if you believe or not, you need to understand. God is. God is love and God loves you. John 3, 16, for God so Love poured it out, lavished his love that he what? Gave. He gave. Greek word for world. He gave his son. He loved the world. That word there is cosmos. And it, it's a broad word. It speaks of all humanity, the good, the bad, the indifferent, past, present, and future. Now, how has God lavished his love upon us. Well, John answers this question by adding that we should be called, look at this, that we should be called the sons of God. And once again, John is showing us God's extravagant love. Yes, yes, God the Father sent His one and only Son into the world to save sinners. Let's say it together. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish have everlasting life. And the Bible is clear that even before sin made its entrance into the hearts of mankind God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had already made the provision for our redemption. Yes, God the Father would send His Son. Jesus would partake of flesh and blood so that yet so He could live without sin and pay this high price 
a price we couldn't pay for our redemption. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would draw men to Christ. Draw men to repentance and faith. Make no mistake about it. God's love was lavished upon sinful humanity as he died upon a Roman cross. Romans 5, 8 tells it best and that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were unworthy and unrepentant and yes, guilty sinners. This is the most wonderful thing. You know, religion says you got to clean yourself up. you got to reach high to God. That's not love and that's not the gospel. No, God reached down for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the people said, Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my king, would die for me? But there's more. There's more. God the Father's love went beyond redeeming us. He's called us and he's made us. His children. His children. I mean, we can hardly conceive of God's grace reaching low enough to die for us. But it's totally inconceivable that He should exalt us to this lofty, privileged position beyond saving us. God in His deep, unfathomable love and grace has made us a part of his family. And he's not ashamed to call us the sons and daughters of God. And this means that we as believers have a bright future. We, we couldn't be called the sons and daughters of God minus the empty tomb. You know that? I mean, Paul tells us plainly that if Jesus had not risen... The gospel message would be powerless. We would remain in under sin's curse and condemnation without hope. But praise God, He is risen. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 9 through 11 that the, the very Spirit, now listen to this, the Spirit that quickened the body of Christ from the tomb lives in us when we believe then he says in verse 15 for you've not received look at this not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you have received the spirit of what talk to me adoption we're the children of God we've got the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father Daddy Daddy the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we what are the children of God and love this look at this here's the resurrection and if children then heirs heirs of God joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him we may also be glorified together wow Jesus resurrection guarantees our adoption, guarantees our own future resurrection. 1 John 3, 1 concludes, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It's been observed that our cellular technology has made us, on one level, the most connected generation in history and yet it's also made us the most disconnected generation in history you know that you ever been in a room and no one's looking at anybody else except for their cell phones and how many have been guilty of that yeah connected but did you know our grace connection with God as his dear ch children 
disconnects us from this present world? An unbeliever. That's what he's saying. I mean, John clearly divides all humanity into two segments. Those who believe the message of the gospel and those who don't. And so while God loves and sent His Son to die for the sins of the whole world, this doesn't automatically make all humanity the children of God in the sense that John speaks of it here. I want you to understand that. Notice what John's words in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. But as many, look at this, but as many as received Him, Jesus, to them, Gave you the power, the right to become the sons of God. Even to them that what? Believe on His name. That's what He's saying. And as believers, our unique parentage from God makes us different. And yes, somewhat disconnected from unbelievers, whether they're atheists or agnostics or even theists. I mean, God's love is transformational, right? It's life-changing. Paul in Romans 8, 29 reminds us that God's predetermined purpose in our life as Christians is to be conformed, conformed more and more fashion into the image of Jesus Christ. A Christian's behavior, activities, speech are more and more to be like Christ. And there's a Christian song that I love to hear from time to time. Jesus on the inside, right? Working on the outside. Oh, what a change. Oh, what a change in my life. That's Christianity. It's not outside in. It's inside out. Yeah. And it's here that John moves from lavish love to lasting hope. The real difference in the lives of believers is that we have God's lavished love. We've received it and we possess because of that this lasting hope. 1 John 3, 2 begins, Beloved, I love this word, now. Don't you love that? Now are we the sons of God. And John lets us know that our standing with God and Jesus Christ is something that doesn't change. It is fixed. Being saved, born again, child of God isn't hoped so, maybe so, but it's a no so thing. And we can know and have full assurance right now. True Christianity, you listen to me, is not a religion of fear. It's not. Once in Christ, all your sins are forgiven once and for all forever. Come on. Once in Christ, always in Christ. There's no no necessity for last rites. All of our sins have been paid in full. And we are. We are the children of God right now. Look, look in 1 John 5, 13. Look, I love John's words here. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that we may what? Know that you have eternal life that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. And you're, in a, you're in a faith or something that tells you you can't know even after you die. You need, a, you need to get back to the Bible. You need a way into the Bible because I don't know how any more clear it could be. John continues in 1 John 3, 2. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Oh yeah, we know who we are, but while we we know who we are presently, we really don't know in the kind of detail that we would like to know what we'll be like in the world to come. It'll be the new and improved version, that's for sure. You know, a lot of questions at death you know can those up there know what's going on down here you know I hear a lot of that you know I don't know that I have answers to those questions it's kind of like a Bart Millard song I can only imagine you know he wrote that on the occasion of his dad's death and he's looking you know and his dad had faith and he's seeing his dad 
and, and you know, standing there in the presence of Jesus. And he says, I can only, yeah. I can only imagine. If you're here and you've lost a loved one recently, you, if they're in Christ, you haven't lost anything. You understand that? They're more alive than they ever have before. Come on. As a matter of fact, they're praying for us. We may not know that. But notice, it continues in verse 2. But we know. <laughs> we don't know. But we do know that when He, you know, our risen Savior shall appear, and the people said, we shall be like Him. I'll take that. I'll take that. Just before he was crucified, Jesus promised in John 14, 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I'll come again and receive you into myself that where I am, there you may be also. The resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees that he's going to make good on his promise to return for us one day. I mean, we're not left completely in the dark about our future state. When Jesus is revealed to us, either by his coming for us or our going to him, I want you to know that our earthly, sinful, perishable bodies will be transformed into glorified, sinless, immortal bodies. We shall be like him. And then verse 2 concludes, for we shall see him as he is. If you ask someone today to name every dimension they know, and they would talk about length and breadth and depth, they might even add time if they're thinking outside of a three-dimensional box. By asking a string theorist how many dimensions are there, it would solicit a very different response. According to this branch of theoretical physics, there are at least ten dimensions of space, most of which is impossible for humans to perceive. Dimensions are the metrics of, that physicists use to describe reality. Now you get your mind around that and just think. One day in our resurrected, glorified bodies, we will be able to have, we're going we're gonna to have ten-dimensional glasses. We'll be able to perceive things that were presently beyond our ability to observe, and what a thrill it will be to see Jesus as He is. And that defines the believer's hope. And so John leaves us in verse 3 with this challenge. It, and every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he's pure. I ask you this Easter Sunday morning, simple question. Is the hope of the crucified risen Christ living in you? Let me tell you something. If it is, you know it. If it is. Resurrection hope in Jesus Christ will carry you through. Come on. How many here have been through some stuff? Raise your hand. How many here are going through some stuff? Raise your hand. The rest of you were about to give an invitation. I don't know about you, but I'm going around saying nobody knows the trouble. I don't know. I it's just a good thing we don't know what's around the corner. But I'll tell you what God does. And regardless what's around the corner, I just want you to know, He's risen. And when you believe the gospel, His Spirit fills you. You know, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What is your life story? What is your life story? Does it include 
God's grace, His lavished love, and His lasting hope. Oh, I, I was just 13 years old on a Sunday evening in church when the Holy Spirit took the message of the gospel and penetrated my heart. On our Wednesday night, we've been, up to this week, we've been challenging ourselves about meeting Christ. And we've challenged you to go back to that time when you met Him for the first time. You've walked some miles since then. You've been in some dark places since then, in some valleys. But you've discovered even there He's with you. The one with the nail scars in his hand on the rhythm side. Is that your life story? Lavish love, lasting love. Have you made a decision to accept God's grace for yourself? Christian, I want you to know if you are saved, God's hope is still alive today. It is. You just need to embrace it. Let's take a moment and stand and bow our heads. We're going to have a verse, just a little quiet time. And if you need to come as the piano plays and every head bowed, every eye closed. If you need to come, you say, well, you know, I, I need Christ. I, I don't have that living hope in my life. Maybe you're a child of God and you're downtrodden. And you're just, you're at the end of it. You know, life can get you there. Maybe this morning you just need to come to an altar, bow at the feet of the risen Savior, and say, here, Lord, this is yours. This is yours. I've got your presence. Walk, help me, oh God. Heal my heart. Help me with this. Do you know him? young or old, in between. Religion's dead. The knowing Christ is a lie. It's a living relationship. Is His Spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you are. You are. You are. Oh, Calvary covers it. Calvary covers it all. It's not about you cleaning yourself. Come to Jesus just as you are. His grace is sufficient. Crucified, risen Savior will come dwell in your heart and make all the difference in the world.
you just look at me just a minute and we'll be seated, but knowing Jesus makes such a huge difference in your life. And it makes a difference how you face trials. It makes a difference how you deal with the grave. Even burying our dead, it, even then we have hope. Aren't you glad for a gospel that goes beyond the grave? Amen? Amen. And it makes a difference in every aspect of your life. This, this morning, if you do not have peace with God through Christ, I pray that before this day's end, you'll listen to his voice. And I just want you to know, there's a lot of people have been saved outside church services, let me tell Amen. you. Probably the far majority, anywhere. The Spirit of God points to your sin and points to Christ. You can say yes to him. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.
Praise God for the hope that is in Christ Jesus. He is risen. Thank you so much, our faithful membership, our visitors. You have really blessed us. We hope we have in some measure encouraged and blessed your heart today. It's great to be together on this wonderful day. And I can't think. Listen, every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so every Sunday we're here and we express our belief and our faith in the risen Savior. You may stand with us if you would. God bless you, Brother Patty John, our pastor, our minister of music. God bless you. God bless you, instruments. You did a great job. And our choir. Our soloist. And you know what? Our sound technician, Ryan. I've always said that uh, the sound people, you know, they're never mentioned unless they make a mistake. It's kind of like being a, a defensive lineman in, in football. Your, your number's not covered unless you're holding. Or something. They do a superior job, and it's such an import, important part, and I appreciate the good work they've done. I asked Brother Sister Petty John if, if they'll be dismissed. I just want you to share your appreciation for their ministry to us today. My wife and I will be here, and I cannot express uh, enough uh, your kindness to be here today. And uh, the good news is it's about 23 till 12. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you can be the first to wherever you're going. <laughs> out of the tomb and out of church. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Which is best. I don't know. But it's been a lot of fun. And thank you. I'm sorry, church members, no church tonight. I am so sorry. I know. No choir practice. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, it, it's great. Brother Cooper, Brother Terry Cooper, it's so good to have he and Sister Marsha with us today. Brother Cooper, would you dismiss our time in prayer?